in our work with asylum seekers and refugees that we do in the Helen Bamber Foundation, my colleagues and I are looking at a society with increasingly punitive legislation and attitudes towards asylum seekers and refugees. And this is a very painful state of affairs for us. We are seeing people who have suffered, and I'm not, by the way, going to go in to that side of our work, but I must just say that the torture and the impact of torture and what it leaves for the individual is something that we see daily in the foundation. A survivor of torture has said it's the act of killing a man without his dying. And there is some truth in that. And our work, not only for people who've been tortured, if you'll forgive the term conventional torture, state torture, um, our work is also devoted to men, women, and young people who've been trafficked for sexual exploitation and labor, and women who've been subjected to female genital mutilation and other issues regarding their gender. Um, we, we, I suppose we could say that we treat um, people who've suffered the majority of, of what I think quickly of human rights violations. So when we talk about a society without borders, and I am looking at people who cannot actually survive very well through the punitive legislation of present day, our present day society. What does that mean, actually? It means that somebody has enormous difficulty in getting to this country, and that when they do, they are nearly always disbelieved. The majority of people that we see are refused um, in the first instance. And our job is not only to treat and to respond and to engage and to embrace in a way that is not normal in um, psychotherapeutic and psychiatric terms, but I mean by that the actual love that has to be brought, and I do use that word, the love that has to be brought in to the, the space that we heard about this morning. So there has to be some other component in space. And um, we have to be as creative as we can be because, I mean, I'll give you one example if I may. I'm working with a man who came here last year. I'm not going to say from where. There are many cases like his. Um, he was tortured, um, I think it was um, about four months before he managed to escape. And it was one of quite a few detentions and episodes of torture. But his last episode was too much for him and he felt he had to flee. When he arrived, he, he came with an illegal document. The word illegal has an enormous impact on people. My next door neighbor never refers to asylum seekers and refugees without prefixing it. She knows where what I work I do, but she will always use the word illegal. She loves it. <laughs> because it means that she can, in her terms, have persecutory thoughts about the people we, we work for in our organization. And um, um, so, okay, he came with an illegal document. Why? Because, of course, there was no other way that he could enter the country but illegally. Why? Because we have made it so difficult for people to get in. He has, was arrested and um, 
charged with a crime for having an illegal document, which was this passport that we heard about much earlier. When I hear the word passport, it has a different meaning. And he came with a, an illegal document, and he was imprisoned for six months. And at the end, I went with a colleague and with an interpreter three times to the prison. And we documented his case, which we do do for asylum purposes at the request of somebody's legal representative. He was in a dreadful state. I'm not going to go into all of this. But um, when he had served his sentence, he was then tagged. And at the, when we protested about the tagging, um, he was then given this uh, voice uh, recognition thing. Don't let's go into it. It's another thing about control. And where I'm coming from, it's persecutory. And it broke this man finally. And we're working with him. And we're still trying to help his legal representatives with the documentation that we're presenting. But how do we be creative when we are working with people who are not allowed to work when they're waiting for their asylum. And yesterday, I had somebody who came in, um, diminutive man, not that I can speak, but he is very, very small and very thin, which I am not. And, um, and um, he was overjoyed. Why? Because he'd been given his... I've got my document, he said. He'd been given his asylum after 11 years of waiting. During that time, not allowed to work, not even at voluntary work. So what does creativity, the creativity that I picked up in the audience this morning and, and, and up here, what does creativity, how... Do we be, how can we be creative? We're very proficient in what we do in terms of extreme trauma, but even in working with that extreme trauma, and believe you me, it is extreme. It is extreme. It means families are affected. The screams in the night, the nightmares, children are bewildered. It means very hard work. We have to find ways, not only in the consulting room of being creative, but we have to find ways in which our people can recover their bodies because it's the body which has been violated. And if anybody's read Brian Keenan's book, An Evil Cradling, I did work with Brian, and um, he always speaks about the violated, the reviled body, the despised body that is cast away. And our job is to bring back that violated body, to honor it, to find a way. And so people who work with us, who work with the body in many different ways, in, with play, with exercise, with yoga, with dance, even with theatre. Um, that is a way very often of helping somebody to reclaim that, that, that despised body. So working with the body is one area of creativity. Working with the mind is much more difficult sometimes. That's very much my job, and that can be difficult. Working with words, with poetry, with images. I have studied psychoanalysis, and I know what I need to be doing. But I have found I have to have, and my colleagues have to have, whether they are administrators or whether they are clinicians, they have to have a form of creativity that gives people a meaning for their lives. Um, so we have um, in the evenings and at weekends um, volunteers who come in, volunteers from the BBC 
who help people to make films, believe it or not. So people, I mean, these films are absolutely enchanting and sometimes very humorous and bring out that, that side of a person that um, we miss in the consulting room, the fun. I mean, we had one gentleman who loved the Hoover. He always loved hoovering, and he did a dance in this film with this Hoover. And it was absolutely, I mean, it should be shown everywhere. I mean, it was just wonderful. And, and we loved it, and we, we wanted to see it over and over again. And then another one was making hummus, and that was hilarious as well. Um, it's not always hilarious. It's not always hilarious. Sometimes there's very sad scenes. Um, but um, filmmaking, photography, and I was touched that one of the f f uh, pictures that they, the, the photographs that they had made, and that really won a lot of admiration, and I think contributed to an award that they got, was for um, was showing people greeting each other, greeting each other in Covent Garden, embracing. I found that so moving. And it's just another piece of creativity, a way in which people can express loss, but use it differently. That's what we're about. There are many other aspects. The music group is phenomenal because you have Arabic sounds, you have um, the saz, Kurdish sounds, African drums. It's fantastic and it's played in the British Museum and elsewhere. But these are people, many of them, who are still waiting to have their case decided. They still wait for the knock at the door, for the deportation, possible deportation. So, yes, they will do their filmmaking, and they will play and dance and sing, but they will wait for that knock on the door. And I work very closely with a family therapist, and this waiting for the knock on the door, feeling that they may be deported back to the country that tortured them or sold them, as many of our people are sold. I have Chinese young people who were sold into slavery or to produce a male child for an elderly man. Horrible stuff. So, yes, I'm looking here at the audience and thinking, if you can think of ideas, think of ways to help us, that would be wonderful. Just ideas would be great. Just thinking about people who've suffered immensely and are in waiting very often. The other thing which troubles us very much we are a charity, and we do have to be careful about campaigns. You do know this, I'm sure. Uh, we have to find ways to give a voice to our people, to portray what is going on, and why there is another way to look at asylum seekers and refugees. I mean, I wonder how many people who watched Mo Farah win that wonderful gold medal the other day. I watched it. I have to because of my sons. I have to watch it. But it was a fantastic run and it was a fantastic achievement. And I won't forget his face, but I do remember that he is from Somalia and that he came here as an eight-year-old child to escape murder and kidnapping, etc., the other way around. So, we need to be changing attitudes. Of course, we talk to the UK, BA, UK border agency. They've now changed their name, interestingly, from the Home Office. It's now the UK border agency. We do speak with people, and there are always good people everywhere. But there's something about power, and the word power was used this morning. And power and 
extreme power and extreme helplessness is what torture is and what our work is about. And we need to be speaking to more people to have more decent publicity, not sob stories. But actually, we do need to be heard more than we are. We can't always bring our people forward. We have to be their voice. They cannot speak. It's too dangerous for some of them, particularly the trafficked people who feel that the trafficker or the snakehead is round the corner. They may not be, but they feel it. So there's the knock at the door and there's fear, but there's also immense creativity, humanity, laughter. I give you... Um, I give you that picture at the end, if I may, to give you an idea that there are people doing this work every day. The place is open six days a week. And um, ideas are very important to us. But so is understanding and so is compassion. Because for us talking to the people we do very often about our people, we find no compassion and no understanding. So yes, I look for, I look for progress, I look for lifting restrictions on borders, but I also look for changing attitudes, because until we're able to do that, I think a lot of the things that we are capable of achieving will not happen. So yes, I was a little bit depressed, but not entirely. I do look to you, and I do thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you. <laughs>